Um, I should say that this work started off with me, um, I think all PhD students start, you know, several years ago with, with um, the uh, idea that they're going to change the world and change the, um, the, the focus of the neurological treatment of traumatic brain injury. And that's certainly how I started. But as I looked more into it, um, I, it came, became really apparent to me there were a lot of barriers to clinical translation of non-invasive brain stimulation. And um, a particular aspect of that is the um, relative paucity of understanding of how the different parameters, both individual parameters um, and also stimulation parameters, affect the um, influence of brain stimulation. So I'm just going to um, thank my funders who uh, funded particularly the Wellcome Trust who funded most of this work, and um, particularly my collaborators uh, in Esviolente, um, and also Danielle, who was my master's student that um, carried out uh, some of this work as well. So as I was saying, the main issue that, that, that I found in trying to translate non-invasive brain stimulation, particularly TDCS, into the clinical sphere is this wide parameter space. Um, we have lots of different types of um, we have polarity, we have uh, length of uh, stimulation, we have how often you stimulate, and then you also have participant factors which um, introduce a lot of variability in the response to brain stimulation, particularly um, structural actually uh, seems to be a very important aspect. And our approach to trying to disentangle this has been to try and directly visualize the physiological effects of brain stimulation, as well as using um, the same technique to assess structural factors about the participant, i.e. using um, MRI. In particular, we have been very interested in white matter structure, primarily because our um, patient population, traumatic brain injury, has high instances of white matter damage and in fact it's considered um, a particular pathological feature of traumatic brain injury particularly severe traumatic brain injury and whilst we're able to um, combine tdcs protocols along with um, fmri protocols this allows us to both um, manipulate the specific uh, parameters that we talk about for example polarity but um, more importantly, perhaps, brain state, i.e. what is the brain actually doing when you apply brain stimulation? And this in itself has very important um, implications further down the line, if you're particularly thinking about applying it clinically, because you might ask, well, do you apply it during the acute period of rehabilitation? Do, do you apply it during chronic? So what I'm gonna to present to you today um, is a study or a series of studies that we have done using groups of traumatic brain injury patients and healthy controls. And in this case, the traumatic brain injury patients act as a, um, uh, as a model for white matter damage. And then I'm going to present how we have more, uh, manipulated the brain state and polarity and our results from this. So what particular networks are, am I particularly interested in this um, study? And these are, in particular, the default mode network, so what you can see here in cool colours, and the salience network or dorsal, and dorsal attention network, and you can see these in the warm colours. These networks are particularly anticorrelated during externally cued tasks, for example, the choice reaction time task, which is a task that I'll introduce a bit later. In particular, I'm very interested in the right inferior frontal gyrus because um, it's been shown to be a sort of conductor region, which itself um, is able to influence the balance of activity within these two networks. And why this is important in our traumatic brain injury patients is that there are um, white matter bundles in particular, which connect this right inferior frontal gyrus region, so this conductor region, to the rest of the salience network, for example, the dorsal ACC. And um, previous work in our um, group and, and by Kotals and the PhD students in the group show that white matter injury in general, and particularly in this tract leading from the right and the frontal gyrus, is very important in um, explaining the abnormal functional connectivity and the abnormal network um, activity that we see in traumatic brain injury. 
and this also relates to their cognitive function. So for this reason, I focused on this particular network and this particular set of patients and the right IFG as the target of stimulation. So part of the, um, uh, so, so some of the hypotheses that we had with this particular study was that if you target the right inferior frontal gyrus because of its links to um, wider salience network regions, that you will modulate um, brain activity, not just under the electrode, but in a wider network. We also hypothesize that the effect of the stimulation is very dependent on the brain state, i.e. it's not a matter of you apply brain stimulation and whatever the participant is doing, you're going to get the same effect. We felt it would be very dependent on what the participant was actually doing. We also hypothesize that we would see polarity effects, i.e. differences between the polarity, but they would not be dichotomous. Um, and I think, you know, I, I started this work in sort of 2016. And I think since then, um, as a result of both mine and, and lots of other people's work in the, the field, we kind of have an idea of the first three um, already um, now. We also had a particular response, uh, a hypothesis about the white matter itself. So if we think that um, brain stimulation is activating a particular area under the electrode, and this then in turn activates all the connected areas, then surely white matter connectivity will you know, be a significant influence on how the brain networks respond to brain stimulation. So just a quick run through our participants. Like I said, we recruited moderate severe traumatic brain injury participants and a set of um, age-matched healthy controls. The age match controls um, did not have previous traumatic brain injury and did not have any previous neuropsychiatric disorders. We excluded TBI patients really only if they um, had seizures within the last year. And that wasn't really because we were worried about the safety of the, of the TDCS, but more that if you have frequent seizures, then you're more likely just to have a seizure anyway at some point during this you know, um, recruitment period. Uh, and we didn't really want to risk having that. So I think the first thing to show is something that we have seen in, a, in a sort of almost every single TBI cohort that we've ever recruited for any of our studies, which is that TBI patients in, in the, the ones in the black dots have, um, as a group, have worse um, or have um, more white matter damage as reflected by lower fractional anisotropy measured by diffusion MRI compared to your healthy controls. And what's also the case is that um, our TBI patients have a greater range. So actually you'll get some TBI patients who are probably you know, not that different to controls, but then you'll get a sort of about a third of them who seem to be really quite um, damaged compared to controls. And we looked at two particular um, tracks. We looked on the left here, we looked at this um, right inferior gyrus um, tract, which um, I'm gonna refer to as the salience network tract. And we looked at the cingulum bundle, which I'll refer to as the cingulum bundle. And then we looked at general whole brain FA. And in, in really sort of wherever you look, mostly um, people with moderate severe brain injury, moderate severe brain injury will have damage in their white matter tracts. So our circuit, and um, as I said before, we are targeting the right inferior frontal gyrus with, um, uh, we, talk, we, we measure that by um, putting it over F8, and we use an extracranial return because we didn't want the possibility of having um, essentially uh, the, the return electrode, obviously that is still active, um, influencing other parts of the brain. Um, and Alex very kindly um, helped us model the density of, the, uh, of where the um, current is to show that we are broadly speaking, getting um, the peak over the right inferior frontal gyrus. The task that we used is the choice reaction task, and it's actually quite a simple task. It's an, it's a visual, it's an external visual cued task. So participants are, at, are presented with a series of left or right pointing arrows occurring at a ran, in a random order, and they simply have to respond as quickly as possible. Um, we use concurrent TDCS and MRI. So what that means is participants went into the scanner with everything set up. Um, and then we were able to deliver TDCS at the same time as acquiring our fMRI. And we felt that was quite important because 
um, whilst there have been many studies even prior to this which looked at um, stimulation effects just after stimulation, we really wanted to see what was happening during stimulation. We used um, a kind of factorial design for our um, protocol where we, you, where we integrated both alternating blocks of tasks. So we would essentially manipulate the brain state between them doing a task, the CRT, and then resting, which was just visual fixation. But on top of that, they could either have either cathodal, anodal, or sham stimulation over that period of time. So you end up with essentially six conditions. You have rest uh, with anodal, cathodal, or sham, which is just the ramp, but without the, the full stimulation. And you can also have task with either anodal, cathodal, or sham. And we stimulated at 1.8 milliamps. Um, we, we tried to get to two milliamps, but there was something about the, 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 the circuit which we found it easily kind of um, topped out with its impedance, particularly on the anode or when we tried to get up to two. So that's why we use 1.8, slightly random, I appreciate that. So I think the first thing to show is that generally we don't see an effect of stimulation on the task. And in some ways this was expected because the task is very simple. They literally have to only press left or right. And actually what we're looking for is over 90% accuracy in the task and, and traumatic brain injury patients achieve this quite easily. And that's in some ways good because what it means is that when I show you the brain network effects later on, we at least don't have task performance effects muddling that picture. In general, healthy participants are a little bit faster than our um, uh, TBI patients. And we see that again, in, in, this is a sort of um, something that we see in a lot of our patients. They're just generally a bit more slow. Uh, it's not a motoric effect, it seems to be an attentional effect. So the first thing I wanna show you is just that, um, you know, to establish that when we apply the CRT, we get the expected patterns of activation in both our patients and our healthy controls. And again, this is past the task selection, we chose it in order that it would be quite a well-conserved um, pattern of brain networks with this task. So even um, in brain traumatic brain injury patients, even though um, it, we do see slightly less, maybe, um, default mode network uh, deactivation than in controls, it, on a group comparison, this, this doesn't bear out. So broadly speaking, they're very similar. And so you see the, the activation of the salience networks, the basal ganglia, uh, the dorsal tension networks, and you see deactivation of um, default mode network areas. So what happens if you apply TDCS? So what you kind of see, so what I'm presenting to you is the interactive effect of TDCS and task performance, i.e. it's not just the summation of the effects, it's the kind of super added effect of these two things happening at the same time. So the first thing to say is that cathodal and anodal simulation seem to do, you know, actually they both seem to activate brain network areas, which are broader than just the right inferior frontal gyrus. And actually the areas that they're activating are areas which are typically active during this area anyway. So you're kind of exaggerating the effect that is already there. We see kind of the inverse effect, if you like, when you take away the task. So this is the same stimulation that's applied, so it's cathodal and anodal, but now this time there is no task. And actually what you see is you have the complete reverse effect. You have a deactivation of the areas of the brain, which are normally active during task, and you have increased activation of the default mode network areas, particularly with anodal stimulation. Again, this is the kind of pattern you expect to see anyway during the task. So what the simulation is doing, irrespective of whether it's anodal or cathodal, is it seems to be um, exaggerating the underlying patterns of brain activation. What about for TBI patients? So the top row you've seen before, I showed that in the above um, slide, but I'm just showing you now compared with the TBI patients. And actually with the TBI patients, I was expecting there to be sort of, you know, much less activation. And there does seem to be less activation, but it's not, you know, when we did head-to-head -head comparisons um, in a higher level comparison, 
they are actually not that different. So again, broadly speaking, even though we've got quite a lot of white matter damage, the brain network um, activation, um, ex which is uh, exaggerated by the stimulation, seems to be relatively well preserved in both in, in the TBI patients. And again, we see the same a sort of similar pattern. And again, the whole brain results seems to suggest sort of, um, you know, seems to support our hypothesis that the TBI patients um, have a less of a reaction, if you like, to the, to the brain stimulation. However, again, on a, on a higher level comparison, this, this was not statistically significant. So I think broadly what we can say is that, um, yes, if you put TDCS at the right inferior frontal gyrus, it does seem to modulate brain activity more widely. It is critically dependent on what the brain state already is. And yes, there are polarity effects, but these are certainly not dichotomous. It's not like cathodal and anode do completely different things. They maybe just do things to a slightly different degree. And finally, I didn't think we could say that white matter connectivity uh, related to greater brain network response, because even though it looks like that on the whole brain, actually, you know, when you compare them statistically, it didn't seem to bear out. But what we are able to do is then look at the interaction between white matter and um, uh, between white matter and brain state. So I'm just going to take you through these stage by stage. So what I'm showing you is the again the the, the effect of cathodal stimulation when there is no task. And what we've seen before is that in both the TBI and the healthy controls, when you apply the cathodal stimulation in the absence of task, you see exaggeration of what you get, which is increased activity of DMN areas and decreased activation of sort of salience network areas. When you consider, or when you use the white matter then as a covariate to see where they are um, where the white matter modulates this effect, you see that there are areas of the brain where um, as your white matter increases in the DMN, the activation in these areas, which are usually more quiescent during task, sorry, more active during task, are even more active. And this is largely driven by... Um, and so this is this is driven not not just by controls or by TBI, but it's driven by both. But I've I've just kind of coloured them differently so that you can see that it's not just a, a spurious effect of having two different groups. We see the similar kind of thing with anodal. So again, it's it's not that anodal does a completely different thing or the two polarities do completely different things. They are doing similar types of things. I when you have an area of the, uh, when you have um, uh, a participant who has a relatively well-preserved and high FA and, and you know, similar to controls, you also have increased activation in these areas of the brain that are normally more active during task. So again, it's helping to exaggerate this underlying um, brain activation that's already dictated by the underlying task. If we look at anodal in this time in the um, absence task, but this time looking at the whole skeleton, again, it's not the same areas, but we see a similar sort of pattern. So the higher your FA, so the greater your white matter connectivity and structural connectivity, the more activation you get in areas of the brain that are usually active when you have no task or during rest, in this case, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So higher FA correlated with increased activity with typically task negative areas. I haven't shown you the areas of the brain where we didn't see this modulation. So um, we didn't see it actually with white matter in the, um, in the salience network. We saw this effect only really with um, the default mode network and with the whole brain FA. So what happens if we look at it when there is a task? Because I've sort of, I think, labored now that the brain state is quite important. So if you look again at the DMN white matter connectivity, when there is a task, so when they are doing the CRT, and this time looking at cathedral, you kind of see the opposite effect. So you now see 
as you have white matter increasing or as you have better preserved white matter, you now have decreased activity in areas of the brain that are task positive, so usually active during task. And again, you see this effect with um, whole brain. So the bilateral inferior frontogyrosis are normally active during task, but when you are performing a task, when you're looking at the white matter connectivity relationship, as, as you have increased white matter connectivity and better preserved white matter connectivity, you have decreased activity in that area, which is the complete opposite effect of the white matter when you're um, looking at it without task. So what we have here is a situation where we've looked at white matter, so we've looked at um, brain state and shown that it's very important in determining what the in determining the effect of brain stimulation, irrespective of polarity on brain network activity. And we also have white matter, which we think is kind of the underlying you know, mechanism by which brain stimulation is causing these brain network activities. And yet it doesn't seem to have a strong an effect uh, or strong an influence on the effect of brain stimulation as the underlying brain activity. So, you know, kind of to revisit our hypotheses, I guess the, the one that we're changing is the bottom one. So is it that white matter connectivity relates to great, greater brain network response? And I think we're showing that in the absence of a task, it seems to maybe do that, but it in fact does the opposite when you do have a task. So I've kind of <laughs> struggled a little bit trying to explain and, um, trying to understand exactly why this is happening. Because this to me is quite puzzling and I would really welcome other people's thoughts about this. Why is it that brain state seems to be so important in, in determining how the brain responds to TDCS? Or yeah, I, I'm saying TDCS here, but I'm, I'm fairly certain this is gonna pan out across different types of brain stimulation. I, my assumption has always been that it's because TDCS doesn't cause direct depolarization like TMS does, but rather causes your probability of depolarization to change. But then why is it that white matter, that the influence of white matter seems to be secondary? Is it that you need the brain state to be a certain way in order to have any white matter influence? Or is it that it's not the white matter structure that's important, but actually it's the gray matter structure, which we didn't look at for this um, particular study. So the future directions that um, you know, I, I would, like to see the field going in, is to look at this idea of um, hierarchy of parameters. And I think this is where modeling work is gonna become really, really crucial because we have this huge parameter space and we have all these things about participants, for example, their brain structure, how much CSF they might have underlying that area, how old they are, what gender they are. But which of these are actually important and which of these are not important and which of these supersede the influence of the other? So clinically, this is important because I need to know, say, the top three that's going to cause the greatest variability in my participants and select that way. And then the second thing that um, I would you know, love someone to explain or do work to explain is how then does the white matter um, correlation with behavioral response that we've seen how does that then fit into this particular story? Because white matter seems to have a very important influence on how stimulation is able to produce behavioral results and behavioral responses. Uh, and this is not just in my own work, but it's been shown now in, in, in other people's work. But how does that then fit with what the brain stimulation is doing to the brain network activity? So I'll leave you with those thoughts and hopefully um, directions for the future. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank mm -hmm. you.